Thank you very much. This is my first meeting in the Academy. But I will ask you to allow me one minute to stand in silence in memory of the man who died today, 85 years ago. It's Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. If it weren't for his life work, I wouldn't be here and you would not have considered me as a member. Thank you very much. It's extremely kind of you. What I would like to talk about today is the essence of mountain building. Uh, this is, you would be amazed to find out, is still a contentious topic. And it had been solved already in the 19th century and Italian geology had a major contribution to it. Okay, these are the active mountain belts in the world today. As you can see, we have the Oceanides, Nipponides, uh, the Alpides in Central Asia, and the Cordilleran chains. These are still actively shortening and deforming. And these are some cross-sections across these mountain belts. And as you can see here, these are the Andes. This is Macron. This is the Calabria and the Tyrrhenian Sea. That's the Marianas. This is Tibet. These are the Alps. This is Oman. This is Western Turkey. As you can see, that all of them are asymmetric. The reason is they all resulted from the subduction of the oceanic lithosphere. And when a new continent comes in to collide with the overriding continent, it tries to tuck its nose under it. But it can't because it's buoyant. And therefore, as I will show you, the origin, the, 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 the shortening, turns into strain. Okay, these are the plate boundaries in the world, and you can see that very few of them, uh, for example, oh, wait a minute, where, okay, oh, here it is, yes, very few of them are head-on like this one. Most of them have a tangential component. You know, most of them have these what we call strike-slope components, and they complicate the structure. There are three kinds, as you can see here. Here is what we call a shortening magmatic arc, like the Andes. This is an extensional magmatic arc, like Japan or the Marianas, and this is a continent-continent collision zone. The closest example we know is, of course, the Alps and the Apennines. Now, mountain belts form by closing an ocean, and this is how we now think they form. They're asymmetric. But there are still many who think that this is the main mode of shortening, particularly after Cottonelle collision. Now, this is an old idea that was first developed by Leopold Kuber in Austria. And these two, this is, of course, by Edward Zeus, 1913, an extremely prophetic drawing. Edward Zeus, an Austrian geologist, in my view, was the greatest geologist who ever lived. He was an amazing man. 
And this is by Emile Argon, showing the structure of the Alps. Now, in the 19th century, James Dwight Dana, working in the United States, thought, following Elie de Beaumont, and even before that by Descartes, uh, the whole globe was contracting. And as a result, as you can see here, certain areas were shortening, and certain other areas, like these, were not. The non-shortening areas he called stable regions. Now, Dana's interpretation of mountain building, you see here, uh, his theory of contraction would not necessarily generate anything like this. Okay? So why did he come up with this scheme? Why did he think that shortening would create this asymmetric structure? His theory doesn't require that. The reason why he did that, because he cheated. He used observations by the Rogers brothers across the Appalachians, and the Rogers brothers had shown conclusively that the Appalachians had a completely asymmetric structure, as you can see here. And in fact, some of the faults, they said, swallowed stratigraphy. The stratigraphy disappeared beneath them, which shows a lot of shortening. Now, they said, well, how can, how can we have that? They believed that the folds they see on the surface had formed above a liquid magma layer. It's quite absurd, impossible, but never mind. They sensed that they somehow had to distribute the opposing stress to the shortening stress, which they thought were caused by volcanic eruptions in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. But now we know that a detachment under a sedimentary cover would do the same thing because it would distribute the stresses. The stresses would come at one end and the reaction would distribute itself over this uh, Decolman area. Now Dana thought he saw these things, he saw these recline folds, and he said, well, the, the way they form is that this B, oh, G, this fold, or excuse me, B and G fold, would steepen, and its weight will make it overturn. It won't. You know, you need a shear. But Dana was really keen to publish quickly get ahead of the others, and he got things wrong. Now, this is the man I was talking about, Edward Zeus, the greatest geologist who ever lived, in my estimation. He was professor at the University of Vienna. And Zeus became aware of the asymmetric structure of all mountains. He first realized that in the Carpathians, when, when he studied a, a water catastrophe, in the Velichka mines, but when he came to Italy, he said, by God, you know, this, this whole area is thrusting that way, and this area, this is the Peloritani, yeah, is thrusting that way. He said, oh, how very interesting. He still wanted to accommodate this in a symmetric mountain building model, because that's what what he had inherited from Elie de Beaumont. So this was the idea, and also alpine geologists love this. You have here these central masses, and you have shortening, as you can see here. The central masses intrude as igneous massifs, and then they subside to create the Tyrrhenian Sea. And this is Basilicata here, and that's Taormina right here. So but this, this was Zeus's thought initially. Then he continued his excursions with his students. And this is the Lipari Island here. Sorry, yes? Oh, sorry. What the hell is going on? OK, this is the Lipari Islands. And this is Aspromonte. Zeus looked at this and he said, how the hell do we produce something like that? Well, it doesn't fit this idea of symmetric mountains. 
This was his idea. He said, here's a crust, you shorten it, you create this big fold, including the crystalline basement, and here are the folds of the Basilicata here in front, farther to the northwest. But then the whole Tyrrhenian mass subsides to create the Tyrrhenian Sea. Well, this is the other side from Taormina. This is Etna. You see the various formations here. And the uh, handwriting here is by another member of the Lince, Professor Daniele Bernoulli. Uh, he has written down for me all the active, uh, the presently active uh, formations and the folds. And Zeus thought this was the other side from the Basilicata. Well, as you said, the Tyrrhenian Sea subsided like this. And here are the volcanoes. And he said there are two manifestations of subsidence, either by peripheral faults, that gives you no stretching at the nadir point, or by radial fractures, that gives you extension in the nadir point. Later, Zeus finally realized that the Apennines go here and the Taormina folds are a continuation of them. They go straight into Talian Atlas. Zeus recognized that after having learned about the Talian Atlas. So there is a whole swing of mountain ranges go around. All of them are asymmetric. Well, how do you make them in a contracting? Well, Zeus didn't know anything about plate tectonics. Here what you see is a section, and uh, this crustal piece is no longer contracting. This is contracting, whereas here, is, contraction is assumed to be nil or homogeneous. Okay, look what happens here. If you glue this part of the non-contracting lid to the substratum, this part extends, this part thrusts. So Zeus had found a way in a contracting earth to make one side extend, the other side shorten. And this is what we see in plate tectonics. I mean, whether you like Zeus's theory or not, it's neither here nor there. I mean, we now know better. Okay, this is Zeus's theory of orogeny. Please notice what happens to contracting block A and less contracting block B and the non-contracting layer on top. Contracting block A contracts more than uh, contracting block B. So there are two components of contraction, one by tangential, the other one radial. And please notice, bingo, the block B inevitably overthrusts block A, and it creates an asymmetric orogenic belt. And the folds of these orogenic belts, if there are any big basement massifs, they go around them. Exactly what we see in Europe, exactly what we see in the Appalachians, and exactly what we see in Asia. Okay, finally, the other side also subsides, like the Tyrrhenian Sea, and creates volcanism. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. This is a cross-section across Asia by Edward Zeus. Please notice the present-day subduction zone. Please notice the uniform uh, vergences here and backfolding towards the Angaran shield or the Siberian shield. In principle, he was absolutely right in everything he did. This was his model, you know, a cross section here. You know, it shows the cone of contraction. If they are small, they create the, ba create the basins in Europe. And if they are big, they create the oceans. He thought of these oceans as contracting cones. In 1949, 1951, uh, Hugo Benioff, using the data by Benno Gutenberg, he said, well, we have, you know, these continents that are overriding the oceans. 
Well, the Dutchmen already knew that. Uh, people like Berlage and Wisse had published these things from Indonesia. Uh, but this was published, Geological Society of America. And uh, after the war, people were reading these things because they were American. This is Hans Stille, 1951. In his contractionist scheme, Stille had to admit that the Pacific was underthrusting South America and creating volcanism. And this had already been said by Edward Zeus in 1909. These are from the Carpathians, where Stille used the same scheme to explain the magmatism. Now, if you look at the various kinds of orogenic belts, these are all kinds of orogenic belts. All of them are asymmetric. Where you see symmetric things like this, these are two orogens colliding with one another. Okay? This is how an orogen develops. Two continents collide. Here's a suture zone. And this continent overrides this one, isostatically pushes it down, you create a four deep, but this potential energy here of the rising welt creates this orogenic wedge that leads to back thrusting, and you get a sort of symmetric picture from an asymmetric orogen. This shows the development of magmet, uh, metamorphism. Here, as you go down, you enter hotter zones, and as a result, you get metamorphosed. All of this scheme could have been deduced from Zeus's work, but between 1924, when Emil Argon died, and 1965, when plate tectonics was invented by Tuzo Wilson, we had a period of stagnation in geology. And people like Enrico Bonatti, who's a bit older than me, would remember that episode where people thought about geosync lines and all sorts of nonsense. You know? <laughs> and Enrico was, was one of the people, both in Italy and the United States, who said, Pah, rubbish. You know, we, we go ahead with this new model. But that new model was Zeus's model. Why? Because Zeus paid an incredible attention to local data. He did not rush to publication. His four-volume, Das Antlitz der Erde, or The Face of the Earth, written over a period of 26 years, and Zeus took the data from all the parts of the Earth and used them. So, hail to field, Joe. Thank you very much, sir.